Okay guys, this is the fire class. This will be the first of a three part series of first is fire kit, then is gathering of our tinder, our wood sources and etc. And then the third one will be on fire theory, fire building, different fire sets and etc. So let's begin with the basic thing. Now first of all, let's understand a little bit about fire theory itself. And I call it a theory because Understanding a fire is relatively simple, but from a science point of view, we still have several things we don't fully understand yet about fire. How different things burn, okay? Everything burns under the right conditions. Steel will burn. Uh, iron will burn wood, stone, rock, name it, given enough heat, enough pressure, enough of the right conditions, everything burns. And this complex action, this dynamic action that creates fire, all of them have some universal points to them, okay? And how it applies to us is that fire is a three-legged stool. And what I mean by that is there are three distinct parts to it. There is fuel, heat, air, more correctly oxygen. These three have to be in a sort of balance, not exact, but a sort of balance to each other for this action to happen and happen correctly. If you have too much fuel not enough heat or not enough air, you smother a fire. That's when they pile too much on it. If you have too much heat, this normally happens when you built up a big bonfire or something big and it's burned for hours and it's got this big bed of coals. I mean, like two or three foot across bed of coals. You'll notice you'll go put a log on top of it and it'll burn with flame for just a minute and then it quits. And there doesn't seem to be anything you can put on there to produce the flame. That's because there's so much heat there, it is consuming the air, it's consuming the oxygen before it gets to the middle. And that's just the outer ring that's actually getting enough air to burn. And when you put stuff in the middle, it doesn't burn well because there's not enough oxygen in the middle. It's too big a heat pile. On the other hand, air. If you have plenty of heat, plenty of fuel, but not enough air, it smolders. And that's how we create char cloth, is we burn it in an environment without air and therefore it will combust, but doesn't produce flame, and it crinkles on down and everything to carbon, but it doesn't produce flames. See, so it's a way of burning. Why I bring this up is I want you to understand what we're doing, what is the dynamic that we're trying to create here. Now, the other thing that you gotta understand that I call is saturation. Now let me explain that. We're going to use water for this. So, beyond this line, water is solid. It's ice, so this is 32 degrees. Beyond this line, it is a gas. This is 212 degrees, and this is the point of boiling right there. Between these two points, it is a liquid. Okay? And that's because of the amount of heat. If it's too cool, it's a solid. If it's too hot, it turns to a gas. In between, it's a liquid. Well, wood has a saturation point as well. And what that means in English is, if I take a lighter, and I take a log this big, and I put that flame up there and I hold it. Well, what is the combustion point of wood? We're gonna make up a number here, guys, because I don't have it at my disposal, but we're gonna say 500 degrees. And we're gonna say the flame that this produces is 1200 degrees. Well, if I've got a log this big and I light that lighter and put it on the base of it, will the log catch fire? Probably not. It may scorch, it may whatever, it's because the mass, like that ice, is 
not in the effect. It's not, it hasn't been brought up to temperature to reach that combustion point. Now again with water, if I take and take a block of ice and put it in a boiler and put it on the stove, it doesn't instantly turn to gas, does it? It has to thaw out, then that water has to warm up, then the water goes to boiling, and then it goes to very energetically boiling, and then that produces the gas. Well, wood is the same way. When we apply the heat to it, it has to warm up to what's called the flash point. The flash point is what we call the moment that it is quote quote on fire. It will now burn. And if it has proper heat, proper oxygen, and proper fuel, that will continue and it will consume and continue burning. So if I took that log, I just used my example, it's this big. I can't burn it with this lighter. I can scorch it a little bit, but I can't. I'll consume this entire lighter holding the flame on it. And it'll never burst into flames. It'll burn a little on the edge. It might start burning and run a little bit, then it loses the heat and it will go out. But if I take that log and I bust it up into small pieces, I bust it up into smaller and smaller chunks, I am reducing the mass. And now this flame's ability to override that and reach that saturation point becomes easier. Imagine I had a sliver of that wood the size of a piece of spaghetti, dry spaghetti, and I put the flame to it. It'll light just like that, won't it? Because the heat can overwhelm it. It reaches the saturation and the flash point. The heat, the air, the fuel, all of these come together and it will combust and start burning. Okay? So, different woods different substances that we're going to use in our woodscraft are going to have different ignition points. This can be a factor of A, what is the environmental condition around us right now? B, what is the material made out of? C, what is the moisture content of that material? So let me go on that just a second. And all of this is going to be relevant because I'm, I'm giving you the idea so when we're talking in just a few minutes about the fire kit, it's how each one of these factors are going to be addressed by components and ways and methods of the fire kit because of this complex question we're saying, I want to build a fire. Well, let's take, for example, paper combust at 450 degrees. Okay. The ambient temperature, let's say right now, is 100 degrees. That means I need to generate 350 degrees of heat to reach that flash point, to bring the material to the saturation that it will ignite. Okay. If I have a flame that produces 1,200 degrees, I'll easily hit that very quickly. But what if I don't have a flame? Well, a magnesium rod produces a spark that's 3,000 degrees. If this is properly prepared, it can ignite it. How about if I just take a flint rock and a piece of steel and hit it? That only produces a four or five or six hundred in the best conditions an eight hundred degree. But most times it's four, five, or six hundred degree spark. That would be right on the borderline of this, wouldn't it? Even if I prepared this correctly, when I create that spark, my ignition source is not generating enough heat to automatically overwhelm this and it burst into flames. Well now, what if the ambient temperature is not 100 degrees? What if the ambient temperature right now is zero degrees? We're in the dead of winter. Well now I gotta generate 450 degrees to reach that point. Now that rock in the knife spark is really on the borderline, isn't it? Even if I prepared the, 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 the wood ahead of time to receive that spark, 
my temperature, my environment is driving that temperature further down, the ambient temperature, so my ignition temperature has to go much higher. Okay, So now I've got to have something with flame or something that generates the heat. And heat has to be generated for a given amount of time. A ferro rod actually produces a spark hotter than the raw flame. However, its duration is very short. We're talking a couple of seconds. I can hold this for a couple of minutes. So this one can saturate and bring it up. This one can be hotter, but it has to have something that can be overwhelmed and ignited easily. Otherwise, this can't generate the heat necessary to do it. So, we've spoken of how the air temperature can affect it. How about the material itself? Dry grasses can ignite in as little as 200 degrees. Okay? Wet grass will have a much higher ignition point because you have to cook off that water. You've got to heat it to get rid of the water to dry it out to reach the point. So let's say that this grass over here is 200 degrees. On the other end of this, let's, some, let's say something like sweet gum, which is a very moist wood. Let's say it's 900 degrees ignition point. That's going to be a whole lot easier to catch fire than that, isn't it? Even if I process this down, its ignition point is so much higher than this, this is going to be far easier to ignite. See? Now, how this is relative is because we're gathering off the environment our fire materials. Our fire kit has to be able to address these temperatures, these extremes, and these conditions because, as I touched on just a second ago, moisture. What if the material is not dry? Bone dry, this dried grasses will combust at 200 degrees. Green, it's probably 600 degrees. Makes a difference. So now the material I'm trying to ignite, so it's 600 degrees to ignite it. And oh, by the way, it's 10 degrees out here, so now I've got to generate 400, you see how real quick it turns into a mathematics problem. And I'm not wanting you to have to take a calculator out there to figure this out. What you just need to be aware of is that even though you're carrying the proper kit, the conditions can make it more difficult for you to get a fire. The, in fact, it's been my experience, the more extreme the conditions, the harder it is to generate a fire. Like, for example, if it is, you know, zero degrees because you're in a really cold environment, it's been snowing, everything's wet. The air around you is at 60% humidity. Those are compounding things. This same material that in the height of summer you could just touch it and poof, it's in flames. Now, under these cold, wet, damp conditions, just doesn't want to burn. So whenever I try to ignite it, it will kind of just, it, it looks, it'll ignite, and then it's just like you just lose it because that three-legged stool, heat, the ambient air is so cool, it's hard to hold the heat. And so once the material drops below that flash point, the fire's gone even though the tender is perfectly dry, or even though the ignition source was so high, if the atmosphere drops it below that point, then it's, it's stopped. It'll break that chain and we lose that leg of the, um, tri the uh, three-legged stool of air, fuel, and heat. So, let us begin to look at how we can address these issues. Okay, now let us get into the nuts and bolts of the fire kit itself. 
The basis that I believe the fire kit should have should contain the following. It should have three sources of ignition, two of which produce flame. It should have three sources of tender, two of which work when wet. Okay. It should have a container, the carrier of it, that can survive being damp and a slight dunk, which means in English, if you fall in the creek, you should be able to get out and shake it off within like a minute or two and not have all your stuff ruined. Okay, it's soaking wet. So a thin little cloth bag is a great way to carry it, but a lousy way to actually work with it because it does not protect it from the environment. Okay? So let's begin with the first one. Three sources of ignition. Since we've talked about that there are going to be conditions when I have to have a saturated um, temperature if I've got to elevate my material up to the flash point. I need something that's going to be a sustainable heat, a flame. And there's several things you can do with that. The easiest that most of us are already familiar with is a Bic lighter or some sort of lighter. We're going to go over <coughs> in a little later on the actual stuff. Right now we're doing what it should be. We'll do a, a tips and tricks in a minute about how you can improve it. But a Bic lighter of some kind. Quick and easy instant flame. These are readily available everywhere. They're cheap and every kit should have one or two in it. The other thing you got to realize is, and there are going to be a lot of people say they're not reliable because they don't, you know, ignite easily or you get them wet, etc. True. Today, people don't smoke nearly as much as they did whenever I was a young man, where it seemed like everybody was smoking cigarettes. And these were being pulled out of sopping wet, sweat-soaked shirt pockets and lighting cigarettes. They were being pulled out of jeans pockets, sopping wet with sweat. They were being, you know, in frozen conditions on oil fields in Alaska being used. That many people would not have been taking these things if they were that unreliable. Yes, there are tips and tricks you need to know to improve it, but they are a very reliable, cheap, and effective source for your fire kit. And so you definitely need at least a couple of big lighters in your fire kit. Another source is matches. And this is called a match safe. And this is an old traditional match safe, and I'll show you some close-ups here in just a little bit. But matches definitely have a place in it, and the type of matches I recommend is lifeboat matches. The UKOs. Lifeboat matches have a extra large and long, and I'll show you this in the close-up, where over half the match is a burning material that once ignited, it can be put under water, pulled back out, and burst back in flames. These were designed for survival matches, and for a fire kit, they're absolutely necessary. Why use a match? It has distinct advantages over a lighter in certain conditions, such as a lighter produces a strong flame and holds flame. The problem it is, is in wind. In heavy wind conditions, when winds are blowing, you're trying to turn around backwards like this and hold it into one hand has to manipulate the lighter. The other hand has to manipulate the tender. I have learned that a match like this where I can produce my uh, tender ball, my bird's nest, and then strike the match and shove the match into the middle of that bird's nest and be able to let go. And I have my two hands to manipulate it. It will continue burning no matter what. It's a chemical reaction. It's going to keep burning. So I don't have to have my hand there like a lighter. And I can maneuver it around to get the best flame moving and put it into my fire and be stacking as opposed to me having to sit there and manipulate a lighter. It has a distinct advantage, especially in extreme cold conditions. Whenever your hands are so cold, you can't hardly feel them, and holding the lighter is sometimes difficult. 
it is easier to claw grip a match and strike it just by pushing away and shove it into the tender than it is to manipulate and hold down and work the actual flame button. Okay? So that's two sources of ignition. The third source of ignition is a ferro rod. These are sometimes called magnesium fire strike bars. They've got all kinds of names, ferro rod, fire rod, etc. But they're a mismatch of metal that whenever you, straight, you uh, scrape it, it produces sparks, very hot sparks in the couple thousand degree range, and that's used to ignite our tenders. These are, give you the most fires as, compo as compared to a uh, lighter or something like this. These can light literally thousands of fires. However, the disadvantage to them is, again, their spark is very hot, but it's short-lived. So you have to have your tender ready to receive it. So wet tenders and things like that, this is not good to light them. You gotta do a lot of sparks to dry it out, as opposed to open flame, okay? So there's three sources of ignition. Three sources of tender, two of which that work when it's wet. Here in the south, the number one is fatwood for a tender. Um, fatwood, for those of you that may not know what I'm talking about, is the part of a pine or conifer tree. Usually down here in the south, it's a pine tree. These trees die during the summer for whatever reason when the sap is running very heavily. And this sap can, can kind of conditions, it kind of cooks in the tree as it's dying and it's, it uh, becomes saturates into the wood itself. It becomes like it's soaked in gasoline. Now I mentioned in earlier videos where when I was a boy my uncle had a pier that they used fat wood uh, logs for the post for the pier and this had been, these pier, these logs had been underwater 25 years in that pond. And I would go out there and lay down on the pier and reach down under the water and take my pocket knife and cut a splinter off of it, pull it up out of the water. It's been underwater 25 years. Shake the water off of it and touch flame to it and it'd immediately ignite and flames would start running and be dripping napalm off of it. Underwater 25 years and it works. As long as you have your tender in a block like this where I can shave down, you're good. The volatile oils that are part of the tender will evaporate over time. Now another source of it is sometimes called Maya dust. And all that is is they've taken fat wood like this, fat lighters we call it, and shaved it, ran it through a grater of some kind, and produced dust out of it, sawdust. This needs to be sealed up like you see in this tent because the volatile oils will evaporate once they're exposed. So, I recommend you keep it in a solid block until time. You can take your knife and scrape this, get slivers off of this, and to make a, we'll go in later on in fire building, where in extreme conditions where my tender bundle or my bird's nest is a little damp. Remember the condition, it's cold, it's wet, it's damp. And I'm wanting to hedge my bet a little bit. I'll take a block like this and I'll split off a long splinter, full length of it if I can, about the size of a pencil. I'll stick this in the dirt or I'll stick it into something to hold it vertical and I'll put some shavings around the base so I can ignite it. The flame will run up this and make a long flame about that high and it will burn like a torch, like a candle for three, four, five minutes. While it's doing that, I will hold my damp tender bundle in the flame and allow it to dry out the tender bundle and therefore ignition. We'll get to that a little later on, but that's one of the reasons for this particular tender. I believe it's one of the best tenders you can get in your fire kit. Now, sources for this. If you live in the south, it's everywhere. Just simply ask anybody that spends time in the woods, they'll point it out to you. And that's a whole other video on how to find fatwood. But under tenders, when we're doing it in part two in our gathering, we will go in depth more about how to find and collect this. But you can also go to a lot of the big box stores during the winter, wherever they're selling firewood, and they will have a box of this pre-split and stuff this size 
up above it or in another box called um, lighter wood, starter wood. I've seen it under several names. When you pick it up, it's normally orange and it has a smell kind of like gasoline. That's the right stuff. You can buy that in the big box stores and put it in your pack. It does the same job. So that's one. The other one is some sort of tender that is waterproof. That means I can get it wet, shake the water off, and still be able to use it. Now this is a commercially made strip, and we'll show this up close a little later on. And what it is, in essence, it's a coil of waxed paper that's been treated that you peel it out, tear it off, and set it to fire. Or this, and this is something you see in a lot of places for sale, is simply a cotton disc that's been treated and then dumped into wax to make it waterproof. With this, I can tear it and expose the fibers and be able to ignite it. So this can be sopping wet. I can take it off and shake it off, tear it to expose the dry fibers, hit it and it's gonna burn and it's gonna be a nice hot flame that's gonna last several minutes. And that's what I want because of, remember, saturation. When I'm making the transition from my fire kit tenders to my fuel, I have to also bring the temp up of that fuel. Now, remember a few minutes ago I talked about taking that log and I was going to take a big lighter and try to light that thing. Well, it won't work because of the amount of heat I have to generate to get that log hot enough to reach its flash point. Well, when we're using our tenders, it has to generate a long enough duration heat. Fat wood, absolutely, and these ma these man-made wax ones, absolutely, as we're, and these right here, absolutely, will generate the heat long enough to make the transition so that my other natural wood, twig, etc., tender that I've got on top, it will now catch and ignite because I reached the saturation point. I give it time to go from a block of ice to boiling. See, I've got to have it heat up, get to the point, ignite. And due to whatever the conditions are and due to whatever the tender is, that's a varying about a different amount of time. So I want something that gives me the time. So fat wood and some sort of tender that can be wet and can easily be used those two are my number one and two choices for it. The third tender now can be an expendable tender, something that I collect and simply put in my kit. This is shredded up birch bark, dried leaves, and several other things that I, and the tops of uh, flowers and things like that have dried out naturally. I have gone and collected them on a woods wall to make these kind of tenders. These are natural tenders. This does not work when it's wet, but this is a cheap and a, actually a free resource. The only thing it costs me is my time to walk and gather it. But it's a, the bulk of my use is going to be this. If the conditions are relatively dry, if my tender bundle and kit, and we'll get more into that into part two, are dry and will be easily ignited, then I'm going to use this tender over these two. I want to save these two tenders for those conditions when I need these two tenders. I want to save my lighter for the conditions when I need the lighter, the cold, the wet, etc. That's the reason I would be using a ferro rod or some other ignition source because this is many, 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 many fires and it's quick and easy with the right conditions, with the right tender in the right setting. Poof, fire, we're good to go. I save these for those conditions. At the same time, I don't waste this in those conditions when it's already damp, it's wet, it's cold, and this might not want to ignite as easily. And so I may combine these two where I take a handful of this and one of these. That way I can get the most out of it. This is absolutely going to ignite. 
This is absolutely going to produce long running flame. This is just adding volume. So I can now dry out my collected tenders and things like that to ignite my fire. So we have three tenders, two of which can be working wet. And there's one other I'd like to add a little piece under ignition. I said three ignition sources, which was a lighter, a ferro rod, and matches. You can add, in addition, some sort of other ignition if you're wanting to practice with it. For example, you want to learn to do a bow drill. Include a small bow drill set and practice with it. Or a magnifying glass for solar ignition. Or some other. There's even uh, very popular in Europe to do a chemical where they carry two kinds of chemicals and pour them together and they spontaneously combust. It's all good. You just got to realize that your kit should be layers to address your situation. Think of it kind of like a game of cards where you've got to have something that trumps this position. If the other guy has got, you know, four threes, I need four jacks to beat him type deal. What are my conditions and what are my carried elements to apply to beat the conditions? Now, carrying our fire kit needs to be something that is small and compact. And we're going to talk here a little bit about offshoots of this. But for the main fire kit is what we're going to talk here for a minute. It needs to be some sort of carrying system that gives me the ability to be in wet conditions, get dumped or whatever. It rides in my haversack. So if I accidentally go head first into that creek, Boom, and it's happened. I need to be able to get up on the bank and start a fire to warm and dry myself out, to get myself back in position. I might be in cold conditions where it's just life threatening. And this is the one piece of kit that we carry that can affect our survival. Absolutely. In the bad conditions, you can die of hypothermia out here if you cannot generate a fire. So fire is the first skill I believe that we need to focus on. It needs to be the skill that you have a good working knowledge of before we proceed to all the other wonders of bushcraft, witchcraft. Because this is the thing that's going to do, this is going to be the basis that we build on. Okay? Now, the kit. I prefer this leather kit. I, and I got it from stitchgear.com. It's roll top, seized up. The material itself is waxed leather, so it's waterproof. I have dumped this underwater and left it underwater 10 minutes and brought it out and unrolled it and the inside is still stone dry. I have fell into the river and fished out of my haversack this kit and was able to build a fire with it because of it stays dry. Whatever carrying method you choose, some people like big old Ziploc bags because they can put their stuff in it and roll it down. It is waterproof. It will keep the stuff together. That is good. But a disadvantage of it is the material itself can burn. I like this because in wet conditions where I'm having to process my tender a little further because of the conditions. Remember, break that log down to the smallest components we can. I want to be able to break it down and therefore see where it's at. Okay. With our kit, it needs to be something that's relatively compact. So as I've already spoken, you're carrying a lighter, you're carrying matches, you're carrying a ferro rod. All of it does not have to be in one place. In fact, it's actually better to carry it spread around your body, multiple redundant areas. So, like many of you, on my knives, I carry a ferro rod. This will be strapped to my belt. I have a small one in my kit, but this is the primary. So if I'm going to build a fire and I'm just going to gather raw material without having to dig into my fire kit, this will be the fire source that I use to create the fire. 
a belt size fire kit like this. That's just like an Altoids type tin, a ferro lens, and then a, another ferro rod back here. Some split up fat wood and some shavings and tinder in there is a very viable little small kit. This does not have to be huge. It should not be encumbersome. It should be something that I can easily hold in one hand because it's going to be something we use over and over again. And I don't want it to take up my entire haversack. I want it small and compact. Now, one of the big advantages of this, now like I said here in a minute, we're going to do close-ups, is that whenever I open it up and I unroll it, this flap section out here becomes a place for me that's dry. So I can lay it down and roll it out and have this section on the inside to sit here and process my tinder further. I can even lay a piece of bark or something up here and ignite it on here. What if the ground is wet around me? I can ignite it on that and then pick the bark up and transfer it into my tinder bubble, you see. So the bag itself becomes a component of my kit, not just the way of carrying it. It also becomes a way of protecting it and a way of some place, a safe place for me to process and do my actual emissions with it. Now, let's touch just a second on, we're going to go into the main fire kit. But like many of you know, I like pendulums. Let's swing it down here because I'm not always going to be able to carry this, right? So what is your EDC? What do you carry? I carry on every vehicle I have, I have a small fire kit. It's gonna have a piece of fat lighter, it's gonna have a lighter, it's gonna have some matches, and it's gonna have some other small tinder, okay? We're talking about small, guys, something like the size of a baseball. And it's gonna be on every vehicle, so that's with me, right? On my person, on my key ring, I carry a small ferro rod. These are available through the Boy Scouts, looking Cub Scouts, it's called a Hot Spark. And it's just a little tiny little bitty fire rod, about that big. That rides on my key ring, and I've got another small uh, container that for putting pills and stuff in, that I put a small amount of tinder. So I always have an ignition source, always have a fire source on me of some degree. I wear glasses, and my glasses are actually strong enough that I can actually do uh, create a fire with that, so there's another ignition source. So my EDC, your EDC, each vehicle should have a small fire kit so that when you get off somewhere, you have a fire kit, okay? On my person, I have this in case I'm on a business whatever and I get stranded out in the middle of nowhere and I have to build a fire. I have a fire kit. My primary, this fire kit, rides in my haversack and it will be the one that I will use the most. My tenders which I gather and this will be in the gathering video, the, the video that will be next in this series. I will talk about how we gather and process this for use. That goes into a larger fire kit and this fire kit is kept at home. This is the one for me to keep all my small sets, the other things that I have acquired together are in here. Flint and steel set, etc. are all in here. And this stays at home. A vehicle kit could be something this size. If you're in a situation where you're a fisherman, and you're going, you have a boat, and you're going to spend a lot of time on water. You should have an emergency set on that boat. Of course, you've got a fire extinguisher, you've got a life preserver, you've got a, a, a horn, you've got a flashlight. Include a fire kit. Something simple, like this size, should be with every vehicle, every boat, etc. The one component I recommend that you add to it is a road flare. Now, road flares are available at any auto parts place. And what a road flare is, it looks like a stick of dynamite. And inside of it is a powder that has a lot of magnesium in it. And you ignite it and it has a way to self-ignite. 
and it burns for 20, 30 minutes, and it generates a lot of heat, two or 3,000 degrees. Why is this important? Because in boating and around water and things like that, whenever I canoed, I carried an ammo can. And it had survival gear in it. And then part of it was a fire kit, like we've talked about. And it had two of those um, road flares in it. Because I can just scoop up an arm load of wet leaves off the ground, ignite that, and just shove it. Like, remember I told you I'd do the match? Shove it into that big old pile and just start piling sticks on it. It has enough heat and duration. It will dry out the tinder. It will dry out the wood, and it will reach that saturation point and ignite it. If I had a log, and I had two magnesium road flares at the base of that log, eventually I will burn that log because heat, time, duration will be reached, and it will burn. So if I took a Duncan, if me and the boat had flipped over, and I've got the boat managed to get to the bank, and I've got hypothermia, I don't have time. I mean, you're like that. Having a road flare that I could ignite, and it's simple to ignite, and be able to put in a pile could be a lifesaver. So that's where we're going with that. You have a mega kit. This is the big kit where I'm not toting this on my back, but this becomes the source for me to replenish my smaller kits with. See? So as I use the natural tender, which is in here, as that goes, I replenish from this into that bag. As me and the wife or the family are out on a nature walk, and I see I have plenty of abundant tenders right here, I go ahead and gather it. I carry a dump pouch, or just stick a quart size or a gallon size Ziploc bag in your haversack or in your pocket. And when you see that, hey, look at all this tinder, go ahead and gather it. When you find that source of fat wood, go ahead and gather it. And that's what this box becomes. It becomes the big kit from which to restock my smaller kit. Now, here's another little quick little thing. If you have a friend of yours that does snuff or chew out of these little bitty tobacco pipe cans, Tell them to save you a couple cans because these are good plastic cans. Now what you do is you pack this with tinder. And what I do is I just take a, a thing of matches. That's a good use for the old book matches. These are not great fire starters, guys. But a box of, a thing of book matches. This is packed solid full of bone dry tinder. I put that across top, I squeeze the lid down tight, and then I run electrical tape all the way around with a quick grab tab that I can pull and open it up. There is a waterproof. I can dunk this under water, it'll float. You know, set that I can put into vehicles, that I can put into other packs and things that I'm not using all the time. If you haven't caught on to what I'm saying, Redundancy is the secret in a fire kit. I want repeatable redundancies. I want three sources of ignition because I'll use the source of ignition best suited to the conditions. If it's dry, hadn't rained in a while, I've got good dry tinder, and I've got the time. This is no pressure. I may take and utilize a burning lens to try and do a coal fire like that. Or my ferro rod. Or I might want to make a bow drill kit and do that. Each one of these, practice a fire skill because there's no pressure on it. On the other end, it's cold, it's wet, it's miserable, and this is, this is getting serious. When that happens, all those primitive methods, uh-uh, pull out a lighter. Sustainable flame. Notice I said, have a couple of lighters in there. If I have to utilize this entire thing because of whatever condition, I have done the best I can to create my tender bundle, etc. And if I have to sacrifice this entire lighter, just sit there and burn it till it runs dry, 
to get it to go, it's worth it. It's cheap, it's replaceable. That's the reason, redundancy, I got another one. So, label them, replace them regularly. How I do this is, and we'll just touch on this briefly, is in my fire kit, I will have lighter. The lighter will have a date on it. Once that date is reached, excuse me, this one's got some duct tape and some jeep wrapped around it, okay? This will be in my fire kit for six months. At the end of six months, that lighter is rotated out and it moves into a vehicle. And a brand new lighter rotates in. The one stays in the vehicle long term. When it's time to rotate this out again, if I still got one in that vehicle, I put two in the vehicle. Remember redundancies. After that, I'll give that lighter away. Find a smoker friend of yours and you're going to light her, and I'll pass them off because I know how much life I got in it. Another secret to these lighters is when you take the lighter itself, you want to get one of the ones that's got a picture on it. And what that is is a heat shrink tube. Slice it and take that off. And usually there's a clear lighter underneath or a opaque lighter. It's white. You can hold that at the light and see how much fuel, uh, fuel is left in it. That makes a difference. So the way I'm doing lighters now is on the base, I leave the very base available where I can hold it up and see fluid still in it. And that tells me it's still got fluid. I can keep it rotated much longer. So. Okay. Now, we're going to move the camera in close, we're going to look at it up close, and we're going to go over each component that I carry and why in my kit. And I hope this will give you a better insight of what to carry in your kit. Okay, now let's look at my fire kit. Like I said, this is a roll top. And what that means is, as you can see, I can come over, it's got a inner, the outer flap is bigger than the inner flap. I fold it over and then I roll it very tightly and this seals it up. And then once I get down here blood tight, I have long ties that allow me to put one in one direction and one in the other direction and wrap around it to pull it down tight and then tie it like that. Okay. This allows me to dunk it or whatever, whatever container you choose to use. It needs to be able to be able to take a pretty good dunking and be all right. Now, and as I said, this leaves this flap here as a place that I can process. If this ground is wet, I can process here and know it's bone dry. And as I process, I can stuff it back under the edge of the bag. Let's say I've got raw material I've just gathered. I can sit here and shave it, whatever, and put the shavings up under here to keep them out of the dampness out of the weather to keep it dry. I have a tube in here. And these are available and what this is, is just a long tube for blowing on a fire. I put my mouth to the big end and blow air so I can focus it down onto a small like tender where I'm trying to get a fire to go or something like that and I've got it just needs more oxygen. I can put oxygen directly where I want with this. Okay. Okay. Now I carry this lighter in here, and this is by Exotech. Now this is basically like a Zippo lighter. It's got an O-ring that seals it up and allows this to be a big source of fire. Now I have fueled this up, and it's renewable as opposed to a Zippo. You, uh, as opposed to a big lighter, you unscrew the bottom and fill it up with lighter fluid. And I have used one of these in my summer heat and not refuel it for over a year where I was able to use it, seal it back up and put it in here. It does not evaporate. So this makes a lighter that I can utilize and refill as opposed to a big. Now here's the big lighter. Remember, two lighters. Two different kinds, two different jobs. This one has got duct tape on it, a big supply of jute, and it's wedging the uh, 
fuel tab up so it doesn't get compressed in the bag and lose my fuel. This is a brand new lighter, never used. And I've got to take this off to utilize it. So that tells me this is still good, has not been used, and therefore I don't have to rotate it. All right, this is a four-sided striking tool. This is for use with a ferrule rod. It's four 90-degree edges. Gives me a really hot shower of sparks. And so I carry it in here for use with my ferrule rod. This is brought out when I need a lot of heat out of a ferrule rod. Because remember I said I gotta dry stuff out some? With this, I can get the most maximum shower of sparks. Yes, I'm utilizing up that ferrule rod, but it will give me the maximum sparks possible out of that ferrule rod. I have a big supply of tinder which is shave, bark, and things like that. I have another ferrule rod in here, and this one has in the cap of it a small, um, it, I got it in there too tight. Here we go. A cigarette butt size tender that can be used as a fire igniter. So it's a tender unto itself. One of those wax ignitable can be used when it's wet. I have two blocks of fat wood, which again can be used when it's wet. It's been kept in block form so I can shave it down to produce my tenders. And I have something called a fire straw, which is wax, is uh, excuse me, Vaseline and a cotton ball put inside of a straw to make it waterproof. So this is another waterproof tender that can be used when it's wet. And then all my dry tender. Now, the block of fatwood goes in the very bottom. This gives me peace of mind to know I definitely got a source. I can shave everything else sopping wet. That can be utilized. The other block goes right beside. Next comes that disc. There's usually like three discs go in here. There is my big ball of tinder. There is my ferro rod igniter down there at the bottom. Small ferro rod goes crossways right here on top of it. Now the lighter to the front. The other lighter to the front. That fire straw tuck over here to the side, and finally the tube goes in. That is compressed down, the flap is folded over, and it is rolled up blood tight to compress all of that down. And then the ties are brought around to firmly anchor it going in opposite directions until it gets like this. Now just wrap it around two or three times and pull, and that's good enough. That is my complete main fire kit right there. Now, this is a ferro rod that the handle is a hunk of fat wood. This is a very good idea, and if you look at here on my primary on my knife, this is also a block of, of fat wood that has a ferro rod mounted to it. I can shave this down in an emergency to generate a fire. I can split pieces off of this with my knife if necessary to start a fire. So I'm carrying an ignition source and a fire source and the back of my knife is 90 degrees so I can shave off of that ferro rod to generate the spark to create my fire. Now I told you I'd give you a better up close to this. It's something I just recently got and it's called the fire strip roll and what it is it's waxed paper that's been treated so it's basically waterproofed but i can take and tear off a piece of it and see how i just pull it out of the middle of this this loop out of this uh roll and now this can easily be processed it's already good to go but just get a jagged edge started along the edge for a flame to catch on and that's a good hot tender that i can generate quickly and easily and get a fire going with. 
This is what I talked about a little while ago where I said that the fat wood had been shaved and turned into dust. And it's sometimes called Maya dust and there are other names for it. But this is just fine pieces of fat wood put into a tin. If you do this, and you can do it yourself simply by taking it and grating it using a horseshoe rasp, shoe form, something like that and generating shavings like this. You need to seal it up into something, otherwise it will evaporate out eventually because you've exposed so much of it. And if you do that, it's, it will not ignite nearly as well as it is when it's fresh. That's the reason I keep it in a solid block and only when I need it do I process it. So that the outside can oxidize to some point. But when I go to scraping it, I expose new uh, volatile oils and therefore I'm getting a good, easily catchable, easily burnable tinder. Now matches. This is a match safe. I have added tape to it because duct tape is a tinder. Not only is it a repair medium, it can also be shredded up and the glue will burn so it can be used as a fire starter. Now inside I carry regular matches. Regular matches are going to be utilized whenever the conditions are warranting it. I don't need to waste my really good stuff. Okay, And then I also have the big lifeboat matches. Now you can see how it compared to a regular match where a regular match only has a, a little bit of an ignitable source on the tip. It half the stick is. Once it's ignited it burns a very hot flame for a minute or two and generates plenty of heat. I can ignite this and shove it into a pile of leaves or tinder bundle and it will keep burning while I'm manipulating it to free up my hands for fire building in whatever conditions. Inside of here is the striker strip so that I can ignite either one of them and I put them inside to protect them from the elements. This is the small fire kit, the belt kit that I talked about. Again there is a EDC that you should be carrying. Then there's something like this, which is a, I'm not planning on building a fire, but I want the capabilities on me. So a small kit like this can be something that you can just slip into your pack or onto your belt whenever you're going for your hike, your bicycle ride, or whatever. It has a ferro rod. It has a Fresnel lens. This is for solar ignition, remember. It has several pieces of fat wood split flat and put in the back and then in here it has a pile of tinder and up underneath there is fire straw which can be used wet so I have in this little bitty kit I have lifeboat matches and striker I have tinder I have a ferro rod, I have a Fresnel lens, I don't have a lighter. Usually I have a small, the little old teeny tiny micro sized Bic lighter that goes crossways the top. I have taken it out of this kit. I'm sorry, I should have checked it ahead of time, but it normally goes sideways right here across it. So I would have all of the same advantages of the big kit. I would have three forms of ignition, two that can be used when wet, I'd have three forms of tinder, two of which could be used when it's wet, and I have a carrier. This one is not waterproof, but I'm carrying it in a, a container that's greatly water resistant, and therefore I could utilize this if I had to, unsnapping it and doing it. The, this has been waxed a little bit, so it does bead water and would help greatly, but it is canvas, it is open, it will not be nearly as good as this, but it is a viable backup kit. So, in conclusion, our fire kit is the first step in the Master Woodsman series. What we're trying to learn is how to create fire. It is the first skill that we should focus on. All the other skills that will be coming of shelter building, foraging, cre creating and crafting off the environment, all of those are many times predisposed to the fact that you can build a fire to heat, to dry out,
to bend to whatever to be able to create a camp and being comfortable in the outdoors fire in my opinion is the greatest skill man ever learned because from fire I can cook my food from fire I can generate light to light up a camp at night I can give myself security I can keep myself warm in atmospheric conditions I can use it as a signaling device I can use it to telegraph long distance that here I am, you know, I'm build a fire on top of a mountain and be seen for miles. It's a very, very, if not the most important skill that we learn in woodcraft is how to build a fire. And to be a master woodsman, you have to master fire in all kinds of weather conditions, in all kinds of developments. And therefore, you need a fire kit, and it's the understanding of the fire theory that I have small, easily ignited tinder. I can use the following sources to ignite it. I have a block of wood that I can utilize, and I can utilize my tools to process it down so that my fire kit can ignite it and utilize it. All of them are about the ability to take what we have and create what we need in the environment. And a fire kit brings those tools to the job. Now, notice I pointed out that two of your ignitions, you know, produce flame and one of them is not like your ferro rod. With time and practice, the ferro rod becomes your primary source. You grab the ferro rod to build a fire with. You save your matches and your lighter for when those conditions warrant it. That's the reason we carry on our knives the big ferro rod so that we can go ahead and have a fire source right there. We can take our knife and process our tenders to where the ferro rod can ignite it. And this is all we need. But this isn't all we need in all conditions. That's what the kit's for. The kit rides in my haversack. That way, in most conditions, with my experience, I'm simply going to use what I've got right here to build a fire. But if the conditions do not allow that, that's when the tenders are going to come out. That's when these are going to come out. That's when I can't find a source of the fat wood or water here close by, but I do have this in my haversack. I can pull it out and process it and have what I need to dry out a tender bundle, to build a fire in inclement weather, and etc. That just simply has to be time and experience. So, the doggies just figured out where I'm at. Now, in the Master Woodsman series, in the fire, we're going to talk, in this video we've talked about the fire kit and the components we should have in the fire kit. I encourage you to gather these components and go ahead and create your fire kit even in some degree, even if it's just some Tupperware thing like this that's small and compact, you know, lunch size Tupperware to put your stuff in to carry the field to practice. I encourage you to practice because in our next segment, we're going to talk about how to gather up from the environment the fat wood, the dry components, and how to gather them, maintain them, and keep them for our fire building. In the third video, we'll actually go into building the fires and how different fire sets can be utilized for different jobs. For example, and I mentioned before, a log cabin fire, and I'll explain this at that time, guys, it generates better coals. And so if I'm doing cooking and I need coals, that's the fire I want to utilize. Whereas a teepee fire, and so I'll log pile this way, 
makes bigger columns of flame and is therefore a better light fire and projecting heat fire like on a cold night. I want something that projects the heat out farther to try to keep me and keep my environment warm. We'll be dealing with that then. So in the Master Wisdom Fire Series, there's definitely going to be three, maybe a couple more later on. We'll see how it goes. But this one was on the fire kit. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, gather up your components, put them into the thing, be ready to practice. And the next one will show you that what to gather to start building fires. Till next time, I'm Blackie wishing you safe journeys. Have a great day, guys.